pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is a pleasure that we can gather this morning to express our love to you, to honor you, and to give you the place of prominence that you so richly deserve. We come here to affirm our faith. We come here today to express to you that we do know whom we have believed. And we trust in you that no matter what is going on in the world, what is going on in our lives, you are faithful and that you are constantly leading us in your righteous ways. Help us as we better understand that and appreciate that and celebrate that today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It is great to be uh, to here with you all this morning. I was beginning to think we were going to have a, a battle this morning. We had, you know, nobody really sitting in the middle section yet, and we've had, you know, all, and anyway, you all seem to sort it out, so good. Anyway, welcome. I'm glad that we can, can be here together to, to worship the Lord, and as we do that, we have lots of things to be thinking about and focusing upon. One of the things that's really exciting about about today is that we get to have some special guests with us today. Brother Jim Wismer is back with us along with his sons Danny and James and they have been in town for a few days and uh, uh, they've all sported the West Virginia look. They all have the, they're rocking those beards, you know, uh, almost like ZZ Top a little bit, you know, but uh, they're getting there. Anyway, it has been a pleasure. I, I can tell you personally, it's been great to, to hang out with Brother Jim uh, the other day and to visit and to just, uh, I don't know, have some, have some preacher time, preacher time. It was, that was really special and I appreciate that. Welcome guys. We're glad that you're here. Uh, also, uh, just a couple of other things. Elders, we're going to be meeting next Sunday morning at 7.30. Next Sunday, uh, since it's the first Sunday of the month, we're going to be taking up uh, two offerings as per normal. And today we get to start the first of the showers, the baby showers. Today we have a shower from 12 to 2 for Lindsay Blackledge. And on the 19th, we have one for Laurel Phillips. Uh, uh, again, from 12 to 2. And a new one, we have uh, a shower being planned on August the 2nd for Marsha Robinson. And she, by the way, is having a girl as well. It's going to be girls, girls, girls. So good. Anyway, I'm glad that we can be together this morning to worship the Lord. Uh, as we do that together today, let's let's put our whole heart into it. And let's, uh, let's lift our voices to Him. Faith. Our next song is Jesus is All the World to Me. we prepare our hearts and minds for communion, we'll sing Jesus paid it all.
we invite all immersed believers to join us as we take this time of communion. One of the Bible's most common images for Jesus is the Lamb of God. Over and over again, it's pictured as a, he's pictured as a sacrifice, a sacrifice lamb, a Passover sacrifice. In John 1.29 and 1 Corinthians 5.7 and in Revelation 6.1, it talks about it. Revelation 6.1 says, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four cre living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And each year the Jews celebrated the, pas the, Jews celebrated the Passover with a meal. It was called the Seder, in which they eat lamb, unleavened bread, a bitter herb, and drink wine the same meal that Jesus had with his disciples. And we take the cup, the wine, as a symbolic, uh, a symbol of his blood offered at the altar. And because Jesus is the Passover lamb, we, we take the lamb. But we don't take the lamb. Even though the Passover was centered around the sacrifice of the lamb, and even though Jesus is the Passover lamb, not one of the new Testament descriptions of the Lord's Supper ever mentions the lamb. We take the bread to remember Jesus' body. It was the lamb that was sacrificed, not the bread. It was the lamb's blood painted on the doorframe that protected the houses from the death, angel of death, not the bread. It is true that Jesus is also spoken of as the word, and the Old Testament often compares God's word to bread. Is a symbol rich in meaning and of its own. But why not even mention the Lamb? Jesus is the bread of life, but he's also the Lamb of God. And those two powerful symbols, out of those two powerful symbols, God takes only one from the Passover meal. In the first century church, you, you meet, you met, they met together on at least weekly more often if possible, in private homes, because it was illegal to be a, a church. You couldn't own a building, you couldn't rent a building, and except in Jerusalem, the temples were all dedicated to pagan gods. The Jewish people had thrown you out of the synagogues, and to enter a Roman amphitheater meant that you had to make a sacrifice to an idol. So the church was multi-site long before multi-site was cool. They met to sing, not only sing, but and to be instructed and to pray, but also to take the Lord's Supper. And lamb was expensive. It was a luxury in the first century. The Jew Jewish people might afford a lamb once a year, but once a week would have been crazy. Bread, however, was the food of the poor and the rich, and everyone in between. Even the poorest family could afford the, to host a small group of Christians to eat bread together. And most Christians were very poor. And so Jesus chose to trade symbolism for practicality, because he thought that it was more important, essential, that the poor would feel welcome and worthy. He didn't want the church where only the well could do, off could host a meeting. He didn't want the church where the poor weren't as good as everyone else. He used bread to symbolize the body open and available to all people and to all cultures and all walks of life and all levels of income and all languages because everyone everywhere eats bread. Just as Jesus wants everyone everywhere to join him at the communion table. Sometimes in our ceremonies we miss that point. But I believe we honor God best when we serve communion. Not as a meal fit for a king, but as an ordinary meal without big displays of wealth and privilege. If God wanted things, if God wanted those things, he would have come as a wealthy man, not as a carpenter, son. He asked to be remembered using the least expensive, most common of all foods, just to be sure that the poor would belong and feel comfortable at this table so that even the poor could host their brothers and sisters at the love feast. So as we take this meal, this love feast together, think of yourselves 
Has chosen. Perhaps a woman who can no longer be. Can no, no longer has a husband and so can no longer provide for herself. And she has to rely on the church for support. We gather to remember Jesus by eating a meal together. And all our hope can afford is bread and wine. And that's enough. You happily do because you came for nothing more than food. You came to remember Jesus, to see Jesus in the face of your, in your beloved friends. And you come now to grow in the love of Jesus. John 6, 27 says this. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Pray with me. Father, as we come before you at this table, we're grateful for this meal that you instituted, for the sacrifices you made on the cross for our sins. So we have this opportunity to remember that sacrifice and to look at the emblems that you chose to use to be remembered by. Nothing expensive, but just the common everyday things, meaning that it's acceptable and open and uh, um, accessible by everybody. And Lord, as we take up this offering as well, we just ask that you will be blessed by it, that we will have a joyful heart in giving it, and that it will be used to further your kingdom. In your name I pray. Amen.
would please stand for the doxology. The complete prayer list will be up on the website at the end of services. But here are the ones that we need to keep in our minds this morning. Mary Guy Moore had her MRI and is waiting results. Emma Hughes will have her tonsils and adenoids removed on July 14th. Marsha Robinson's father, John, and his wife, Sasha, had a wreck this week. Sasha had surgery on three of her lumbar vertebrae fracture with the lumbar vertebrae fractures. Uh, Marley Wilbanks, pet brother to Avan, Ted Avance, a granddaughter from uh, Corinth, uh, needs our prayers. We need to continue to pray for those affected by the coronavirus and for those working on a cure. Glenda Youngblood has shingles. Jim Hart Holland had open heart surgery this week and is recovering. And we also need to continue to pray for the unity of the church. Go with me in prayer. Father God, we again thank you so much for allowing us to come into this house of worship and just to praise you. And we ask that our, our praise and our worship is, is a blessing to you and is a sweet smell, smelling offering to you. We just ask that you uh, be with uh, Mary Guy Moore as she continues to wait on her results. We ask that they are clear and that everything is okay. We ask that you be with Emma as she gets ready to have surgery. Be with the doctors as they get to re they do the surgery. Give her comfort and realize that this is, you're in control and that you were there. We ask that you be with uh, Marcia's father and um, stepmother as she's recovering from the surgery and the accident, and that they are going to be sore, but they are they are alive, and we thank you for that. We ask that you be with Marley to uh, Wilbanks. You know exactly what's going on with that. And we just ask, we just lift her and her family up. We ask that you continue to, to give comfort to those who are affected by the virus, that you will also continue to give strength to those who are searching for um, a vaccine for the virus that, that will come quickly and that this will all be a distant memory soon with everything that's going on with the with the virus Lord we ask that you be with uh, uh, Glenda as she's dealing with shingles and we thank you that Jim was able to have open heart surgery in his home recovering and Lord, we just continue to ask that there is unity among us as a body of believers, that we strive to, to have the unity among us all so that we can continue to grow your, your church. But we also ask for unity as a church as a whole, that those around the world will see the church as something important and different and something that they are attracted to. In your name I pray. Amen. Now, if you are would have normally gone to Children's Church, would you all want to come down here this morning? We're going to spend just a couple of minutes together. And I just, as I was listening to Brother Ryan pray, I was thinking about Taylor Leslie. We need to add him to the prayer list. That's a young man. Uh, Regina and Larry Gates' grandson that had a 
really bad accident and is doing better, but we need to make sure. Hey guys, how we doing? Yeah, pretty excited to be here, right? Yeah, you look really super excited. No, I'm, I'm kidding, you look great. It's good to see you. Did you notice what I have down here? Ugh. These are big books, aren't they? You wanna pick one of those up? Pick one of them. How big that is, isn't that big? heavy yeah you know where I got these I found these in my office this morning these are books in my library these are books that uh, at some point I think I read most of them I'm not sure it's been a while right do you imagine if well first of all do you realize how smart you'd have to be to write one of those books that's a lot of I mean pass it on down let them oh gotcha ha ha here, let him, let, you want to check that out? Pass it on down here. Yeah, yeah, pass it to, there you go. Heavy, right? Imagine how smart you'd be if you knew all that. Yes, that'd be pretty smart, wouldn't you? Yeah, uh, you guys want to get smart, don't you? That's a good thing. Knowing more stuff, right, is a good thing. You know, Jesus had something to say about uh something though that's kind of related to learning things he gave a little bit of a different perspective he said he, he brought up this idea of being wise Do you know what it means to be wise wise that's kind of like being smart but it's different you know what the difference is I'm gonna tell you what Jesus says the difference is Jesus says that, you know, stuff like this, books like this, uh, are Bibles that we read, that we can learn what's in the Bibles, and we can get really, really smart. But Jesus actually told something called a parable. A parable is a little story to illustrate the difference between knowing stuff, being smart, and being wise. You know the story? I bet you do. The wise man built his house upon the, what? The rock. Yeah, you've heard this one, right? That's what that's all about. See, the wise man, the wise man, wisdom, wise. And what made the wise man the wise man and not the foolish man, because Jesus makes it very clear, both the wise man, listen to this, and the foolish man were very smart. They knew what the word of God said. Hmm. The difference? The wise man built his life upon it. The foolish man did it. In other words, the wise man took the things that they learned in God's word, the Bible, and they tried to live them. Okay? And when we do that, there's a word that God says about us. It's called, we are wise. And that's a great thing. Wisdom. That's something that we should be looking for. So, it's great that you want to be smart, especially you guys missing Sunday school? Missing Sunday school a little bit? Yeah, we, that's one of the places where we get smarter, isn't it? But don't forget, it's not just about how much we know. It's about how much we put into our lives. Okay? Awesome. Can you guys just put those books right there? And you can go back to your seats. Awesome. It's good to see you guys this morning. Good morning. And if you'd take out the sheet that's in your, I don't even remember what color it is this morning. Is it pink? The beautiful pink sheet that's in your bulletin this morning. Uh, we're going to be continuing to focus on this idea of better understanding the virtue or the language of faith. We have been uh, spending time the last couple of weeks in the throne room, haven't we? We went, uh, we saw Isaiah's perspective of the throne room in Isaiah chapter 6. Last week we went to John's perspective as he was invited into the throne room of God. And we, be, we built upon uh, this understanding of who God is. I appreciate that song we sang this morning again. I know whom I have believed. That's very important that we do that, that we do know in whom we believe. Today we're going to pivot and we're going to continue to take this, this stroll, if 
you will, into a better understanding of what faith looks like so that we can integrate it into our lives. We can do just exactly what we were talking about with the children, taking what we learn and putting it into our lives. As redeemed people, we are to take uh, our place in a messy world and to represent our King, King Jesus. And the message of Jesus, the message of Paul, the message of John, and the message of the Old Testament is that we have been tasked with advancing and announcing the reign of Messiah, of King Jesus. And so as we continue to speak and learn to speak the language of faith, uh, we need to remember one critical thing. You'll notice the first scripture that's in your outline this morning. I want us to make sure we hear this, because if we miss this, then everything else we will have missed. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says that if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a, a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. That's important, isn't it? What I want you to see, as the title of this sermon suggests, is that the virtue of faith and the virtue of love go hand in hand. And we're going to, to look at a, a beautiful illustration of what that looks like. Faith and love do go hand in hand, but oftentimes in the moment of a conflict, in the heat where there's passion, oftentimes this is where we stop our ability to be able to fluently speak the language of faith because we dismiss, we forget about the idea of love. But today, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that would be easy for us to just skip right over. It's a short book in the New Testament. It would be easy for us to skip over it uh, because it is so short, and it oftentimes we don't spend a lot of time talking about it. It is the book of Philemon. And believe it or not, brothers and sisters, we have, I've actually included the entire portion of the book of Philemon on one piece of paper. You can do that. That's how short it is. It's just a few verses. And so I want us to, to look at it together this morning because what we are going to see is a picture, actually three pictures of how faith and love integrated, working together, present this beautiful picture that demonstrates what it means to speak fluently the languages of, of faith and love. It starts at the about midway down the outline. You want to follow along with me? Here we go. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet... I prefer to appeal to you, appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and for me. 
I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, not no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that's the end of the book. A short letter. Let's talk about this just for a moment, just to make sure we understand what's going on. Of course, we know who the Apostle Paul is, don't we? He is in prison. And while he was in prison, uh, a young man by the name of Onesimus a runaway slave of a man named Philemon came into his presence. What a dangerous thing it is to be in the presence of the Apostle Paul, right? Uh, I don't know how you talk about a, a captive audience. But Onesimus became a follower of Jesus at the feet of Paul. And now he's serving Paul. He is ministering to him and a great benefit to him. But there's a problem, obviously, because Onesimus' presence with Paul is eventually going to create a, a breach in the relationship between Paul and Philemon, dear brothers in Christ. And so therefore, Paul has to figure out how to move forward with this. Now, as we get into this, and we're actually going to look at the problems for each of the three characters that, that, uh, that we're going to discover this morning, but uh, we're going to see how, at the end of this, how hopefully what you'll see is a beautiful picture of how faith and love is to be managed by each of us as we face similar types of circumstances. Let's look at it together. Let's first look at the problem for Paul. The problem for Paul. Paul approaches this letter very differently than most of his other epistles. This is perhaps the most personal, the most intimate letter that Paul writes. He cannot change the way things are, but his relationship, because of the relationship that he has with Philemon, he realizes that things cannot go on as they are. He considers uh, Philemon to be what he describes as a partner in ministry. I looked that up in one of those big books uh, in in the Greek language, and the word that is used there for partner is exactly the same word that we sometimes use for fellowship, the word koinonia. You've heard me talk about that, koinonia, this fellowship that we share amongst ourselves and with him. And that's what Paul is saying about his relationship with Philemon. He considers Philemon to be a partner in ministry and vice versa. 
So it would not be appropriate under any circumstances for the situation to remain as it is. Because if Philemon finds out that his runaway slave is now at the feet of the Apostle Paul, that's going to create a division. Can see, you see how that would create a problem? Sure. And so what does Paul do about that? His chief concern isn't to win an argument. His chief concern is to build up the faith in Philemon and the faith of Onesimus, the runaway slave. How, here's a question, how do you get a Christ follower to see a better way forward? Especially when they have been wronged. That's what Paul is doing. This is not an easy thing that he is trying to do. And so Paul appeals to Philemon, not on the basis of authority or rank, although he could have, but instead, as he very clearly says, how? On the basis of love. On the basis of love. In the meantime, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that he is prepared to risk his relationship with Philemon as he steps into the unseen. Remember what faith is? Now, faith is confidence in that which we do not see. Conviction of what we do not see. Paul is willing to move forward even though he doesn't know how it's going to end. He doesn't know how Philemon will react. Philemon is a person of his own. How, does he, how is he going to react? And what about Onesimus as he's tasked with taking this letter back to Philemon? Will he run away again only to make the situation even worse? He doesn't know. But he moves forward anyway. The world we know, uh, the world will know, Jesus told his disciples that they are his, that we are his, and one of the ways is by the love that we have one for another. And that love isn't just something that we sing about, it isn't just something that we talk about, it is something that is on full display. And you know, as well as I do, in your families, in your workplaces, in society, and even in the church, there is going to be conflict, there's going to be struggle, where each of us are going to be faced with the choice of do, when we're sure what right is, how will we take what we know right is saying, and yet do do it with love, which is what we see Paul doing. Again, this whole thing could blow up, but Paul prayerfully and humbly, like Jesus, deals with it. Let's go on. Let's look at the problem now for Onesimus. Onesimus. Paul writes in verse 12, I'm sending, I'm sending him who is my very heart, back to you. One of the clever things about this book, Onesimus. That's a, that's a cool name, isn't it? Onesimus. I love saying that. In, uh, in the language there, uh, Onesimus means useful. Useful. And you'll notice how Paul takes that name useful and plays with it, doesn't he? He was, he says to Philemon, formerly he was useless to you, but now he's useful to me and now useful to you. Yes, interesting. The last person, Onesimus, however, wanted to ever see again, I'm sure, is Philemon. Try to put yourself in his shoes. A runaway slave who now is being instructed to go back to his master with hat in hand, not knowing what is going to happen. Apparently had a pretty good thing going on in Rome with Paul. 
But Paul knew that it wasn't right, it wasn't complete. Living with the unreconciled situation with Philemon was going to stifle growth, it was going to stifle ministry, it was not going to allow for the peace of God to reign in its fullest. Onesimus had to learn that being a Christian affects all relationships, even those in the past. Let me say that again. He had to learn that becoming a Christian means all relationships will be now different, especially even looking back at those in the past. Again, try to imagine yourself in his shoes, walking back to Philemon's house with the letter in his hand. Talk about faith. What is faith? Faith is the conviction of things not seen, you know. Confidence in the things we don't see. Yeah. He couldn't know what was going to happen. Culture, the culture of his day, would have expected Philemon to kill him. He had that right, and it would have probably been perfectly acceptable, even as a Christian, to show what you do in those situations. The road for Onesimus meant to walk into the unseen, the unknown, but to do it, why? Because that's God's way. God's way will not always be comfortable, but it is what we must adhere to and to do it with love. Which brings us now to Philemon. The problem for Philemon. I, I think that Philemon was in the, the toughest spot of all here, really, when you think about it. No doubt he was very furious with Onesimus. That would be understandable. By rights, as we've said, he could do pretty much to Onesimus what he wanted to do, and he would have probably had nobody telling him that he shouldn't. But instead, Paul prays for Philemon to let faith and love have its powerful effect. What Paul does here is that he sharpens the situation's focus when he says that sending Onesimus was akin to him, Paul, sending his own heart. How can you do that? How can you say that? Well, you can say that and you can do that because of that koinonia, that partnership that has been established. If there's no relationship, if there's no partnership, then it will be much harder. And so, brothers and sisters, that's part of why, as followers of Jesus today, one of the things that we should be doing is stirring one another up into fellowship, into partnership, one with another and with him. Because, guess what? Life is messy. There will be conflict. That is inevitable. It's how we react to it that really is important. You see, often we don't have the issues framed that sharply, what, what Paul is saying. He's saying that, I, I'm sending you my heart. Well, how in the world is Philemon going to be abusive, going to be harsh to Paul's heart? Paul is the one who led Philemon to the Lord. That's not going to work. And so Paul suggests what I would think is an elegant solution to the whole problem. And again, it draws on the idea of partnership. Philemon could either keep Onesimus or let him go. But the decision had to be his. Paul offered Philemon the option of faith and love by insisting upon Onesimus' return. Onesimus offered Philemon the option of faith and love by taking that hard road back. Faith 
and love led to these two brothers appealing to one another, not with demands, but with love and respect. They believed that faith and love that are demonstrated in the way that we're seeing here is powerfully able to overcome all faith and love. So let's let's uh, play devil's advocate for a moment, okay? So what if they're right? What if they're right? What if Paul's right and Onesimus is right? They, you know, he, Paul makes a suggestion, Onesimus goes back, Philemon accepts him, embraces him, sends, you know, with grace to Paul. Then what do we see? What do we have? We have an incredible picture of Jesus in action, of koinonia and partnership, where these three now brothers in Christ are not willing to let anything stand in the way of their partnership together for the sake of the kingdom. That's powerful. And that's what we're called to be about. Well, let's look at the other side, though. What if they weren't correct? What if they misjudged Philemon? What if Philemon is really ticked off and he doesn't care? It doesn't really matter. Because then Onesimus, even if he is killed, he has done, he has been faithful to do what he should have done as a follower of Jesus. And if that is his penalty, then that is his penalty. Again, sacrifice is a part of who we have been called to be as followers of Jesus. Sacrifice even to the point of death. You know what's weird about this story? We don't really know how it ends. We don't know how it ends. We don't have, and they lived happily ever after. I would love to tell you that and they lived happily ever after. We don't know. About the only clue that we have is that we do discover the name of Onesimus listed as one of the elders in the church in uh, Ephesus later on in the Word. Whether this is the same Onesimus or not, we cannot be certain. We don't know how the story ends. It really doesn't matter how the story ends. Because if you do, listen, if you do what is right, what is righteous, in a way that takes into consideration the relationships, the partnerships with everybody involved, there is no wrong. It is right. No matter what the result might be. Now, the reason I chose this text to illustrate what we're talking about today and how faith and love work together, how we take what we've learned from the throne room of God and bring it into this messy world that we live, is because I would like to suggest to you that at some time in your walk with God, you will assume the role of Paul, you will assume the role of Onesimus, and you will assume the role of Philemon. Let me explain. You will assume the role of Paul. You will be the wise one who is going to be called upon when facing a difficult situation to see beyond it and to see through it and to help map out a course for others who are in conflict. You will be called on to be Paul. There is going to be a time when you can identify with Onesimus. You are going to be the one who has blown it. You are going to be the one who has run away. You are going to be the one who has disappointed, who has failed. You are going to be the one who is going to go, have to go back and humbly, graciously clean up the mess that you've made. Yeah. Here's how to do it. And yes, likely, you are going to find yourself sometimes as Philemon, the one who's been offended, the one who's been wronged. And how will you react? 
to a brother or sister in Christ who is coming to you, who is doing the right thing, who is risking, how will you respond? Let me suggest to you that the little book of Philemon is a powerful book. In fact, it's, in my view, one of the most important books in the New Testament because it gives us this beautiful, concise picture upon which we can draw. Because conflict among Christ followers is pervasive. It's common. There is congregational conflict. There is conflict among denominations. There is conflict, this may come as a surprise to you, but there is conflict in marriages, even among Christian people. <gasps> Shock. Yes. There is conflict among followers of Jesus with respect to gender. There is conflict with respect to followers of Jesus, respect to race. It is all over the place. Opportunities for us to employ what we learn from Paul and Onesimus and Philemon. This picture that we see modeled for us is gives us a beautiful picture of the, the language of faith and love when oftentimes we get so wrapped up into the idea of being right and knowing what's right that even if we try to act upon what's right, we get it wrong. Why? Because if we do it without love, what does Paul say? It's nothing. It's worthless. Next week, we're going to look at one of the worst examples of doing this in the entire Bible. Just to show you how not to do it, okay? But in the meantime, in the meantime, brothers and sisters, let me call upon you to... Uh, to just dwell on the truth of God and the wisdom of God and, and realize how it is that what we've come to understand is true about God needs to be lived out and, and, and seen with a heavy dose of love, the love of God. Let's pray as we ask God to help us. Father, help us. To live by faith, knowing that even when we've discovered what truth is, what right is, what you've called us to do, we need to be mindful about how we do it so that we're truly doing it your way. Bless us in that. Help us as we better try to understand that. Father, help us to sense the, the partnership that we do share with one another, and may it grow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peyton's going to come now and lead us in a song of decision. If you have a, song, or a decision that you would like to make this morning, I would invite you to come. Would you stand with me as we sing together? As we say the benediction this morning, could I invite you to turn around and look at Brother Jim? Because Brother Jim is going to lead us in the word of benediction. Brother, would you lead us?